Okay, I think you're good to go, Lourdes. Okay. Well, welcome everyone um, to the, well, I think there's still people coming in. Uh, so I'll give, I'll give people just a, just a few more minutes, but um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Lourdes Chamorro. <laughs> And I'll introduce myself in a little bit. Um, do you have a few more people in, in the waiting room, Al? No, go ahead. Okay, okay. So uh, welcome to the 1,223rd meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington. And I'm president-elect of the society, Lourdes Chamorro, and I'm uh, a weevil expert with the Systematic Entomology Laboratory with the USDA, for those who don't know me. Um, and uh, so I'd like to call the meeting to order. I'm, I'm uh, covering for Jamie uh, today. He, he couldn't make it, he's on holiday. Um, and um, so I'll be, I'll be doing this for the first time, which is great. Um, so as you notice coming in, the meeting is, is being recorded. So if you don't wish to, to appear in the YouTube channel, uh, you can turn your video off uh, and you'll remain anonymous. And that's a, a reminder that we do have a YouTube channel uh, where you can find uh, the, the talks uh, that we've been having with the ESW now for, I think, uh, for the past year and a half. I think they're all there. And I'll put the uh, link to that in the, in the chat for, for those who are curious and want to see. Okay. Yeah, the link is always on the bottom of the flyer too. People can find yeah. it there if they want. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, okay, and um, so the next will be uh, Gary Hevel with reading and approval of the minutes. Gary, take it away. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the 1222nd regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington was called to order by President Jamie Zenizer at 7 p.m on the 7th of October, 2021. The meeting was in virtual format and 58 members and guests were in attendance. Recording Secretary Gary Hevel read the minutes of the May meeting, which were approved. In the absence of membership and communication Secretary Elizabeth Young, the following applicants that were presented in the minutes became mem members at this time. Cabrina Hughes, Alina, Avanesson, George Heimpo, Ken Snyder, Emmy Keel, Judy Gallagher, Abigail Martins, Hazen Buckley, Jeff Clark, Michael Merchant, and Tara Presmail. President Zonizer read the names of new applicants Jay Abercrombie, Brian Gilbert, Jeff Webb, Raphael Colorado, Alexander Orfinger, Brandon Randall, and Alano Contreras Ramos. Alan Norbon presented a short video of mystery insects photographed by Tina Litwack's son. David Adamski identified them as woolly aphids. Alistair and Susan Danowitz briefly displayed a large grasshopper and colorful butterfly that they had found during a recent trip to Costa Rica. Program chair Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker of the evening, Dr. Akito Kawahara from the McGuire Center in Sarasota, Florida whose talk was entitled Evolution and Diversification of Butterflies and Moths, Anti-Bat Ultrasound, Ultrasound Jamming, Acoustic Deflection and Visual Lures. Dr. Kawahara and colleagues received two NSF grants for the research, which involved high-speed videos of moths and butterflies in aerial battles with bats. Spatial physical structures on moths allowed them to navigate the night sky in darkness. After presenting detailed research on moth and bat interactions, Dr. Kalahara spent some time on describing the McGuire Center and its importance, followed by action efforts that can be done to foster better environments for insects. There were many questions from attending members before the meeting was adjourned at 8.25 p.m. Thank you very much, Gary. Sure. Um, anyone have any um, corrections or comments? And 
Do I have a, a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. A second? Second. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth and uh, Al. So the minutes are approved. Thank you very much, Gary. Next is the reports of officers and the different committees. And um, we would be presenting the nominees uh, for office, uh, but we'll delay that a little bit um, and we'll send the membership an email regarding that in the coming days. Uh, and, uh, and now uh, Elizabeth Young, if you could uh, introduce new members uh, and, and then after that we'll have any visitors who may want to, to introduce themselves. Thank you, Lettuce. Uh, there are actually no new members to uh, report of in the last month. Uh, so any anyone visiting, uh, please uh, feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And, and Elizabeth, do you have to read the names of the new members from the last meeting? Well, I, I, I absolutely can. I apologize about that. Uh, <laughs> no, no problem. Sorry. <laughs> the new, the uh, now official members who are announced in October are Jay Abercrombie, Brian Gilbert, Jeff Webb, Atalano Contreras Ramos, Rafael Colorado, Alexander Orfinger, and Brendan Randall. Thank you so much for becoming members, everybody. Uh, we love to have you here. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And, and we also um, want to remind uh, the membership uh, that um, to renew your membership, well, actually, that, that's new business. So I'll, I'll, go, I'll go back to that. We'll do any unfinished business, if there is any unfinished business to, to pick up. Woman. She's a weevil specialist. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> this is the South American one, I mentioned. Um, do we remind people to, to, to mute themselves? Thank you, <laughs> as they come in. Okay, so we move on to new business and um, this includes renewal of membership, just a reminder, and there will be a, a, new, a form that we'll send out as well with that email regarding um, uh, the renewal and also when we announce the, the the new um, uh, nominees. Now, do we have uh, the next item of business is presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. And we welcome those who are joining us if they want to share um, anything interesting about insects with us, you're welcome to do so. And I think you can just unmute yourself or maybe Al has to unmute you. Um, they could do it themselves, I think. Okay. Yeah, and we've had some very interesting things that people show uh, new books, if you want to share that. Uh, I remember Matt Buffington was showed this interesting um, racket that acted like a, a way to swat insects. And uh, so, it, you know, anything that you have, a new, a new movie that features insects or um, that, that, you know, maybe for the next meeting, you're all welcome to. To, to present something like that. We're always interested in hearing what the community has to say and what they're finding perhaps also locally that also would be very interesting. Okay, so um, if nobody comes forward, then we'll move on to the next item. And this will be program chair, Alan Norbaum, um, who will be introducing our, our feature speaker, Dr. Julie Urban. He's an associate professor, research professor at Penn State University. So please take it away, Al. Okay, thanks, uh, Lourdes. Yeah, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Julie Urban. She's, a, a, as Lourdes said, a research associate professor in the entomology department at Penn State University. She earned her PhD in evolutionary biology from the University at Albany. She studies uh, plant hopper evolution and their co-evolution with multiple bacterial and fungal symbionts. Her recent work involves aspects of basic and applied research on the invasive plant hopper, the spotted lanternfly. 
Uh, she's been a member of USDA's technical working group of scientists advising management and research on the spotted lanternfly since it was first detected in the US in September 2014. Dr. Urban is the lead PI on our regional USDA NEFA Specialty Crops Research, research Initiative Grant studying the biology, management, and reducing the impact of spotted and lanternfly and specialty crops in the Eastern USA. And she's um, gracious, graciously agreed to um, speak with us. And she just told us she went to the ES, drove out to the ESA meeting and is on her way, on her way back. So she um, stopped in in Missouri in order to, uh, to participate in our, our in our meeting. So we're really grateful for that. So um, no further ado, please go ahead, Julie. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you all for the opportunity to be here. I'm really excited to talk with you today. And so um, let's see, can you see my screen all right? All right. And so um, I'm here to tell, tell you the story of, of Spotted Lanternfly and, and also um, part of the story is also how someone like myself, who was trained in really basic science and, and systematics, is now really involved in applied research. And especially if there's any students in this group to really, um, I hope I can express the lesson that this, this distinction between basic and applied research is often somewhat arbitrary and in and, and a way we tend to pigeonhole ourselves. And so um, I study plant hoppers. And so plant hoppers, as, as many of you are, are aware, are a really diverse uh, lineage of insects. There's, a, there's 21 families and over 14,000 described species. I became very enamored with them because they show such you know, interesting morphological diversity. And in terms of the extent to which they're studied, um, the delphacity here in the top left portion of the screen, uh, these are notorious pests of really the major cereal crops of the world. And so um, they're really problematic in the US as well as in, in Asia and throughout the world. And, um, and with these, for example, if you have an outbreak of Nilla parvata lugans or, or Sogatella forcifera, the, the brown plant hopper or white back plant hopper in Asia, they can knock rice production down by 80% um, from direct damage and from viruses. And so those are particularly pestiferous. But um, among these families, one that I'm sure many of you are kind of familiar with is somewhat this, this trophy family, this really interesting, rather tropical family um, called Fulgordi. And they're commonly known as the lanternflies. There's about 5,000 um, species, and they're mostly distributed. Um, they have a mostly circumtropical distribution, like Horma <laughs> delicatula, the uh, spotted lanternfly, is one, is the most temperate, really. And so um, you may know, but why, uh, why they're called lanternflies? Um, it's kind of a, a British colonial name, but basically many species have this um, empty extended head process. And it was thought that it housed bioluminescent bacteria that made them glow. That's the only hypothesis that's been tested about that head process. And, and no, that's not true at all, but that's how the name lanternfly caught on. And so um, we know that spotted lanternfly, uh, it was a, a pest that was invasive in South Korea beginning in 2004. So it was kind of on, on everyone's radar. I mean, and especially for someone, a, a chapter of my dissertation involved um, reconstructing the evolutionary history of the family Fulgordi based on you know, molecular sequence work. And for that, I got to you know, travel the tropics and really um, bur uh, beat the bushes, so to speak, to try to find any Fulgorids. They're not very numerous. And I've also sequenced regions of their endosymbiont genes. And I'll talk about this. They have um, obligate uh, bacterial symbionts that have co-evolved with them. And so that's a lot of my original interest in lanternflies as well. Um, but, but basically, this is a, a somewhat unusual group. And we all knew the one pestiferous species. And I saw uh, Stu McKamey, hi Stu, when, uh, when a lanternfly adult was intercepted, I think in 2009, and Stu had to, Stuart had to ID it. Um, I ended up getting a leg to include in my DNA phylogeny. So I was super excited. Um, back at that time, but it was in 2014 um, when this beast first appeared in um, eastern Pennsylvania. And so at that time, um, I was actually uh, working at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, and uh, it was 
it was the end of September and I got a phone call from, from a colleague that I knew from graduate school. He happened to have been trained under a plant hopper taxonomist, Charles Bartlett at University of Delaware. And I, I hadn't heard from this guy for like 10 years. And I get a phone call, you know, saying, hi, Julie, you know, it, it's, it's me, Leo Donoval. Um, uh, this is confidential. Call me back. And he was working for Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture at the time. And I knew I was like, like Horma's here. I was, I was uh, excited. And so those of you who know what full gourds are, you might understand the excitement. The way I explain it to audiences is, is, is that if you like spent your, your scientific life studying penguins and having to, you know, go to all, you know, and basically travel extensively to try to study and collect your, you know, find your penguins and observe them. And then suddenly your backyard was filled with penguins. Your, your first reaction would be one of excitement. And, and then, you know, once I started working on it, I realized, okay, you, you really don't want your backyard full of penguins or in this case, um, full gourds, but we'll get, we'll get to that story. But in when it appeared, it was first detected September 22nd, um, 2014, I have specimens. They were sent to me to determine the genetics of the origin of it uh, from September 26th. And within two weeks, the um, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and USDA put together a technical working group of scientists to help advise them. And so at that time, I was asked to be in that group, as was Stuart and some other folks from around the country and from overseas. And so um, I've been working on Lanterfly since that time. And in 2016, I had the um, opportunity to come to Penn State. And so if we look at the, the business parts of, of Lanternfly, um, Spotted lanternfly is a hemipteran. And so it's in the Akenarenka or the throat beak group of hoppers. And you can see its mouth parts are fused into a straw-like beak that it, it inserts into plants to feed primarily on phloem. And so if we look at um, a spotted lanternfly in action, you can see that the mouth parts are inserted into this plant and the stylets inside, which are two hair light structures, will actually penetrate in through the plant cells and, and deplete um, the phloem, but also hit other tissues. And, and I'll talk about how we're studying that in a bit. But um, how did it get to the United States? And so what's interesting and, and unusual about the family Fulgority is that you know, most other plant hoppers and, and any other really sap feeding insect um, tends to feed, it, it tends to lay its eggs where its offspring can feed when they hatch out. When the nymphs hatch out, they don't have wings and generally they're not very mobile. And so typically you'll see egg masses laid on viable host plants, but spotted lanternfly doesn't do that. Here you can see some egg masses that are actually laid on stone. And so what's interesting here is that um, spotted lanternfly uh, doesn't lay on just anything because it's an invasive and we see it in such high numbers. In work that I did in the tropics where you have native fulgorids in very low densities, and we would typically find their egg cases on rocks. You know, um, I felt it an insult that some mysterious fulgorid would lay its eggs on, on my door in the research station in Borneo. And I had a hard time except for doing the genetics of knowing who it was. But this is something that fulgoridae do because the nymphs are so highly mobile as we're seeing with lanternfly. And so um, sometimes those egg masses are apparent. Sometimes they're sloppy and they really don't cover them with that, um, what looks to be a waxy covering. Um, but regardless, they're very cryptic. They're very hard to see. And so based on where um, lanternfly was first detected and based on interviews with um, employees, you know, in this stone yard uh, who, who had seen them earlier on, um, we were pretty clear, it's pretty clear that it was shipped on a shipment of stone, most likely from China. Um, either the egg, eggs were on the stone or on the pallet or both. And, and that's how it got here. And so, as I said, it was detected in 2014, but based on remnants of old aid cases in the area and, and interviews with, with these employees, it was likely to have been there at least two years prior to that. And if you remember, you know, any weather in the, in the Eastern US back at that time, that means they would have been here and would have survived that polar vortex that we had at that time. And so lanternfly will feed on over 100 different species of plants and trees. 
And, but one of the things that contributes to its success as an invasive is that one of the things it likes is tree of heaven or Atlantis altissima, which itself is an introduced invasive in this country. And so it's problematic for many reasons. One of them is because tree of heaven grows in disturbed habitats. And so, you know, where we have lanternfly, for example, in New York City, um, uh, there's an established population in Staten Island, and it actually is in all five boroughs. But for um, ag and markets, when they have to do their surveys, they have to go up on the tops of buildings and, and survey the Atlantis that are growing out of cracks. And so it's, it's really challenging to try to, nobody's really tried to manage Tree of Heaven very well, but it's really rampant in um, highways and in rail lines. And really that's how we see Tree of, Tree of Heaven, how we see lanternfly moving, kind of following these Tree of Heaven pathways. But the other thing that really makes it challenging to deal with is that um, if you cut it down and don't kill it with an herbicide, um, basically all you're doing is proliferating more growth. You're stimulating more um, suckers underground and you can even see these little uh, green spots um, that are, are little sprouts. We call them candy canes for lanternfly. And so in that stone yard, they cut down the lanternfly and actually Stuart was there with me and we found the first hatchlings of that second year of 2015. And they were out and feeding on these hatch on these um, little shoots. And so um, because tree of heaven is so hard to control that contributes to making lanternflies so hard to control. And so um, immediately USDA um, imposed, actually um, PDA, Pennsylvania Department of Ag, um, imposed a quarantine on the six townships shown here in yellow, which were, you know, which were the only townships that were found to be harboring lanternfly at that time. And you can see there was like a slight creep in 2015 that, you know, additional townships were added based on those surveys, extending into a couple of more counties. In 2016, they expanded it to include more townships. But then in, in 2017, you can see um, they, they actually quit um, quarantining only townships because by the time they got to all these blue townships, many of the townships had similar names and nobody knew what anybody was talking about. So they just went to county level. And, and so you can see um, there were multiple counties in, and you can see Philadelphia County down here and looking at the inside of the state, we're just here, um, you know, on the border of with uh, Philadelphia um, is, is down here in the center, down lower right. But but basically, um, what we saw is that in 2017, um, earlier in the year, the populations, it was pretty clear they were expanding. That was the year that um, I kind of recognized that all those penguins in the backyard were a really bad thing. And, and how we saw that was that there was a vineyard um, and that my, my student, I was started to co-advise a student with uh, Mike Saunders, who's our now retired grape entomologist. And uh, where this um, infestation is and where this quarantine area is, is about two and a half, three hours east of State College. And so my student who was doing work on it, she needed to, um, she wanted to test insecticides against spotted lanternfly. And she had been working with a, with a vineyard and they agreed to let her have some vines that they wouldn't treat so she could um, apply the chemicals and test their efficacy. And so when um, the student Erica and Mike and I went out there in March, uh, we rode around with the, with the vineyard owner's son to scope out our rows. And we saw post after post just slackered with lanternfly egg messes. And again, it was pouring down rain, but it was apparent that, oh man, this, this is pretty bad. And, and we'd been working in that vineyard. Um, I was working at the year before, she was working even the year before that. And so that was really daunting. And then later that year, um, when lanternfly uh, adults emerged, this is a video that my student took of lanternfly on grapes in that particular vineyard. And you can see if you look where my cursor is, this female, is, she's going to shoot out um, a bunch of honeydew. You can see these droplets of water or spurts of water. Um, because they feed on sugary phloem, they excrete sugary excrement. We call it honeydew. But you can see how the insects and the, the grapes and the, the vines themselves are just dripping with honeydew. And so um, we saw these very heavy infestations. And, and that was certainly alarming. Um, 
since that time, I think the highest number of lantern flies that we've ever counted on one vine is upwards of 450. So you're talking extremely high densities here. And these are rather large insects. If you haven't seen them, they're um, a little over an inch long. And so something that large feeding that heavily is, is really gonna do a number on grapes as we see. And so um, what else we saw that year that was really alarming was that in that same property, they moved on to apples. And this is a video that I took. and the insult to injury when one climbs across the camera lens. Um, but, but basically this is interesting in a, in a couple of different ways. And, and I'll talk about the life cycle you know, briefly in a, in a few slides, but lanternfly um, hatch in, in Eastern Pennsylvania at the end of April, beginning of May, they go through a series of molts. So they have four different instars and then we see them emerge as adults around the end of July. And so they'll feed and kind of stay where they are um, in, in that particular life stage. But then actually these videos were taken around September 11th that year, just remember the date. Um, and, and basically in that late season, we think it might have something to do with their, with their reproductive biology, but also it's when um, Tree of Heaven in particular will start to senesce. They fly and move into high numbers in new areas. And so this, that vineyard where I had shown you the, um, the posts that were slackered with egg masses, um, it has 40 acres of grapes and then he has apple and they were never on the apple. And then this year they came in mass and you know, you can't really tell in this video, but they would feed you. We could see them feeding. We could see them excrete honeydew or honeydew. And so essentially that's when politically it hit the fan. You know, we knew the numbers were high, but that's when the federal government knew it was high. We've been working with USDA. We had an emergency um, session uh, with, with USDA and the um, Pennsylvania State uh, Senate and House had a joint hearing and it's like, we need to fix it. And so um, just to give you, this isn't a video we took, but to show you what we're talking about in terms of numbers, because it'll move at that time, especially onto maples in people's yards. So homeowners were absolutely freaking out. Okay, to me, that looks like I could collect a lot fast, but I know that's not most people's reaction to it. And so um, since then, it spread to uh, every state that's contiguous with Pennsylvania. You can see it spread throughout much of Pennsylvania. Um, purple dots are where it's popped up. So you can see that Landerfly is a really good hitchhiker. Um, as I said, it's in all five boroughs in New York City. And we've seen... Uh, uh, the way, way it spread has really been along um, rail lines primarily and highways, but you can see down through Pennsylvania, there's a rail line that runs through that takes it to Altoona Fish, but also that co-occurs with 76. And then into, um, into Virginia, that's I-81 and also rail lines. And so it's uh, popped up. You can see there's a disjunct population over here in Indiana this year. Um, it'll pop up in um, California, Oregon, and Washington. Last year, there was one adult, mostly those are dead on cargo flights, but there was one in, that showed up live as an adult in California last year and one very recently in the state of Washington. And so what does it do to grapes? Because it's, it's at that, you know, even, even when we see it in vineyards um, as nymphs, it'll, it'll feed on grapes like all stages of its life cycle. But when it, basically in that late season, when they move to find more food, that's when they really come into vineyards. And so uh, a survey that was done looking at damage from 2016 or, you know, getting grower feedback from 2016 to 2018, we saw our first reports of, of damage. And, and what was interesting is that we saw um, growers more than tripled their, uh, the number of insecticides that they applied just for lanternfly and they more than tripled what they were paying for it. And this, this was happening in those vineyards that still had damage. And so, um, you know, we, we've given a lot of tours to different officials from USDA and whatnot, and we would take them to that vineyard where we had the egg masses that were slackered. And um, let me show you what that vineyard looked like in 2019. 
all 40 acres completely dead. And so there were other factors that likely contributed to this. Other, you know, potential management things, other, you know, weather certainly, but, but it, 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 lanternfly really did a number on it. And so we're seeing this more in other vineyards. This is a different vineyard where we've been working um, outside of Allentown. And, and you can see these aren't grapes on the ground. Those are lanternfly that have been you know, like basically the grower sprayed a spray and knocked them down. And it almost looks like they're mulching with lanternfly. And so the issue is that um, at this time of year, uh, growers can't apply systemics or can't apply um, insecticides that are very long acting because they have a pre-harvest interval. They can only apply short acting compounds because harvest is coming. And so they can knock these, you know, knock them down with a spray, but lanternfly will just keep coming in and will keep just swarming in and they, they really can't keep up with it. And so that vineyard has seen some damage. And I just wanted to point out this particular picture um, we're, we're working with folks from California, California Department of Food and Ag, folks from New Zealand, you know, a lot of places that are worried about lanternfly getting into their grapes have, have come to work with us and try to learn what they can do and learn what they need to look for. And when um, this person from New Zealand Biosecurity was with me, he was like, oh, what's that lovely lake out there? And, and I didn't know what he was looking at. He's looking at this reflective surface out here. And, and actually that's the roof of the Amazon distribution center and other grocery distribution centers that are completely circled with semi-trucks. And so when those doors are open and these lanternflies are flying, you know, no wonder, no wonder they're getting into things. And so I had mentioned a quarantine, but basically any of those areas that I showed you in that map are under a quarantine for any business, not just businesses transporting plant materials or, or that kind of thing, any business um, needs to comply with spotted lanternfly um, regulations. They need to be permitted and they need to not move any life stage of lanternfly out of the quarantine zone. And so you can see when you think about um, impacts to different businesses, this could be really problematic. And so interestingly and fortunately, you know, even though it's killed um, grapes and it has killed tree of heaven, which nobody really cares about because that itself is a, a bit of a noxious pest. Um, but to date, we've never seen it do any damage in apple or any stone fruit. It'll move in, it'll feed for about three weeks, but then move off. We're certainly worried, and, and one of my collaborators is Tracy Lesky, who led brown marmorated stink bug work for over a decade, and, and she's at the fruit research station, the Appalachian Fruit Research Station. Um, she's looking into whether or not, you know, feeding when uh, apples are first planted, if that might, you know, might be a problem, but so far, no problem there, so, so that's good. But the other industry we're seeing that's really being economically impacted are nurseries. And so this is a, oh, let me, this particular nursery is in Eastern Pennsylvania and they almost went out of business. And so you can't, um, you can't really tell in this photo, but these trees were just filled with spotted lanternfly and they would get in, they would get into the topiaries and the other plant products. And the only thing a lanternfly won't eat um, are conifers, but they'll still get in there. And then that means they can be transported. And so they have to go to great ends, kind of we've, we've worked with them to try to um, help them determine how they can change their packing procedures and take advantage of, of morning and evening hours when lanternfly aren't as active to try to pack or how they need to spray and whatnot. But um, if you think about egg masses getting laid, you can't, you can't see them. And so these are egg masses, if you can tell on Christmas trees. And so the Christmas tree industry was really hit the first couple of years, but we've worked with them, Penn State has worked with them and they, they've got an amazing like uh, marketing arm. And so they were able, able to kind of get in front of this. And if you buy a Christmas tree with egg masses on it, they hatch out in your house. There's nothing for them to feed on. Don't worry, just make sure you mulch your Christmas tree. Um, so they're not really seeing the negative impacts that, that nurseries are. But um, we just had a symposium at the ESA meeting uh, two days ago. And, and basically this was about, um, we had everybody, um, we had folks from Pennsylvania, myself, New Jersey, um, uh, New York, and, um, and basically California and West Virginia reporting out 
what are the impacts? Because you can imagine with an insect that feeds so broadly on so many different things, and as I'll talk about in a second, what it feeds upon depends upon what's in the area, it's all relative. Um, as it spreads throughout the country, its impact is going to evolve and adapt as the, as the theme of the meeting was, it's gonna change as this thing spreads. So we need to, it, I, I don't know exactly what it's going to do, but it's going to probably have different impacts. The other area that's, that's problematic is that because it excretes all of that honeydew, uh, that's a substrate for sooty mold growth. And so we had seen in, um, in South Korea where lanternfly was an invasive, sooty mold growth was actually the main way it damaged table grapes. Um, it blocked photosynthesis in the leaves and it also um, uh, damaged the aesthetics of the table grapes. And so we're not really seeing that here. I don't know if they apply a lot more fungicides um, here and, and that's not really an issue so much in grapes, but we see it in understory plants. And fortunately, lanternfly doesn't really seem to penetrate into forested areas. It's really more of an edge species like brown marmorated stink bug, but it can still deposit, you know, so much honeydew that that sooty mold is killing the understory. And certainly um, understory plants, mulberry, that kind of thing um, are, are food resources for wildlife. So this might have long-term implications. It also might have longer term implications for regeneration. And so with that idea of what's it going to feed on when it gets to other areas, we have some funding from California Department of Food and Agriculture, but also in, you know, coupled with USDA and Pennsylvania Department of Ag Money to try to see, okay, is it going to move on to crops that are of interest in other areas? And so we've done some preliminary work looking at essentially force feeding lanternfly and, and seeing if lanternfly can survive. These are pretty artificial studies. There, we have some ways that we're gonna improve them a little bit more by looking at nutrient status of the insect and how that changes. But basically if we, if we bag them and constrain them to a plant, uh, can the insect survive? And if so, um, also what impacts do they have to, to plants? And so if you, if you did register for ESA, um, there's an on-demand talk by my postdoc, Holly Sugar, summarizing two years of data on this. But essentially, um, fig and avocado, you know, yeah, they're survive, they're, they'll survive, um, but they don't really do much damage. Same thing with kiwi, but berries. Um, they will feed on really anything herbaceous, especially the early instars can't get their mouth parts through the woody tissue. And so it could be the case that different berry crops, if that's what they have to travel through to get to something else, they could potentially do a number on them. Interestingly, um, backyard growers have reported damage in cucumber and we did see they'll survive and they'll knock back yield. And hops, um, last year when we did this study, we didn't see really any damage, um, but this year those hops really took off where we had them planting. And, and if you put enough lanternfly on, on the vine, it'll just wreck it. And so in fact, we even had to um, pick off ambient lanternfly that were there already feeding on the hops before we could start this experiment. And then we know that grapevine and tree of heaven are, are really, um, damaged by lanternfly, but we're, we're constantly kind of working to improve this list, try to know your unknowns. And so um, I'm, I'm leading, or basically when everything hit the fan, a couple of things happened. We realized, well, you know, Penn State owns this because it's in our state. We need to come up with solutions for our growers, but also we realized that, you know, a lot of different folks around the country and folks, scientists at APHIS and ARS, you know, all of us were doing research, but we recognized the need to come together in a more organized fashion. And so um, I, I led a large group of folks uh, and we put in for a USDA NIFA specialty crops grant. It wasn't funded the first year, it was funded the second year. And, and for those of you in these funding circuits, you might remember that was the first year in a while that they required a dollar for dollar match in-kind match with non-federal funds. And I remember when I learned that and learned we were invited, I thought, wow, if I had $8 million, I wouldn't be asking for $8 million. But um, the way we got that match was that um, following Tracy Lesky's lead from Bremer and Stink, Stink Bug, uh, we went to growers and said, hey, can we, can we use your land and, and do this research with your land? And we were able to include 
you know, an estimate of the value of that land for it. And so I was pretty proud that um, across all our institutions, Penn State, you know, being where we're really um, in the in the thick of it, but also, you know, these other institutions and Virginia Tech and ARS really came through um, because they have very strong relationships with growers. And of that 7.3 million we needed to raise and match, over 5 million was raised with support from using grower land. And so I'm, I'm pretty happy that we're working very strongly with them. And so our objective our objectives of this grant to kind of give you an overview kind of briefly here, because there's a lot going on of what we're up to. Um, kind of the first things were fix it, knock this down, keep the keep the grapevines from um, from getting killed. So essentially figure out your insecticides and communicate it. And so those were our first objectives and um, Penn State was actually got funding from Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture to do this. And so what was interesting, so we started to um, in 20, spring of 2018, while we were still submitting the first pre-proposal for the SARI, um, we said, all right, we need to do this insecticide work. And so we have insecticide people being a, a systematist, this was all completely new to me. Um, we don't have lanternfly uh, in, in um, Center County where State College is, so we can't use that experimental station. The insecticide guys work, Dave Bittinger, Greg Krawcheck, they work in Biglerville in the southeastern part of the state at the Fruit Research and Extension Center. They didn't have lanternfly. And so we said, all right, we need a place to, to put our, our plants. And so Dave told me, Julie, I need to find a place for 500 potted grapevines and 250 potted peach trees. I'm like, I do molecular biology. How big are 250 peach trees? Like, I have no idea, right? And so um, with the direction of our dean, we uh, called on the Commonwealth Colleges and Penn State Berks is in Reading and it's right in that area. And they said, hey, we have uh, field plots for horticulture research and for turf grass, do it here. And so since then, every year we've established um, not just this first round of studies, but we, that's where we have hops in the ground. That's where we did those other, um, other studies looking at impacts on other crops. And that's kind of our, our ground zero for all of this research. And so that's only, you know, two and a half hours from state college, but we tested, um, you know, that first year over 20 different chemicals, uh, we've published it, but more importantly, we, uh, provided fact sheets for all sorts of stakeholder groups. And those, those and everything else is on our extension um, website for Spotted Lanternfly. And so what's nice about that is that uh, it's easy to kill a Spotted Lanternfly. A lot of things, you know, a lot of the things don't act for a long time and the pre-harvest interval is a problem for grapes, but it's, there's a lot to kill a Lanternfly and we continue to update these fact sheets. And so just to mention, if you get Lanternfly in your state, it's a really expensive problem. And so we've, fortunate, we've been fortunate to get outreach money, but basically this is the number of physical fact sheets that we've distributed at different events at Penn State just from 2018 till 2020. And so we've distributed 90, over 98,000 management fact sheets for re what residents need to do. And I just wanna mention, uh, we did a lot remotely and online via COVID. This doesn't count downloads. This was before we, um, this is while we were still in person. And so there's a big demand um, for information on Lanternfly. And so to kind of cruise quickly through here to give you some of the fun research, um, Lanternfly goes through, um, uh, four different instars. The first three are these little black black jobs, and the fourth is is red. And you know the adults are very showy. We know what they look like, but if you look at the life cycle of it, why is lanternfly such a problem? Well, it's it's just kind of a recipe to, for disaster. The eggs, because they can be laid for anything, uh, on anything, they're eggs um, for eight months of the year. So that's a really long time that you're able to travel. The other thing is that the nymphs in particular feed on a really broad range of host plants. And so if you have lanternfly in your backyard, one day you might see them on your multiflora rose. The next day you'll see them on cucumber. They're constantly moving. And this is a theme that really we talked about in our symposium. Um, no plant hoppers are known to use any kind of chemical cues for mating. And so lures don't work. We don't have a lure. And when you're feeding so broadly on so many different things, they're widely distributed across the habitat. You don't really know they're there. 
The fourth instars start to move on to woody plant tissues. They really like black walnut at that time. But again, because they're moving so broadly and they're constantly on the move, what they go to depends on what's in the area. And so that's really hard to predict. And then they're adults it, um, for four months of their life cycle. And what's kind of interesting is that they are the only plant hopper any of us know about, you know, Stuart, any of us in the United States, Lois O'Brien, people, you know, Terry Baguan, people in the Paris Museum, all plant hoppers have five instars. These guys only have four. Okay. Okay. And so it's like that, that adult stage is particularly long. And this is when they feed voraciously. And in September is when they need to move on to new things. And so this is where, all right, you know, we can nuke them with chemicals and, and try to solve the problem, but that's only buying us time till we understand their biology better to really come up with more, more sustainable solutions. And, and there's a lot of stuff we're doing. Um, the first thing with that is to predict when they're going to hatch out. And so the student who is working with Mike Saunders um, and worked with me, um, basically she reared them at, reared the egg masses at different temperatures in, um, in growth chambers and took measurements and, and looked at when they hatched out in the field. So you can see when they hatch out, they're a little white. You can tell happy birthday lanternfly if you see a little white lanternfly. And so from that, we, she was able to develop degree day models for hatch. And so even though they don't occur throughout the country, uh, we built a model, it's up on our grant website, stopslf.org. And, and basically this shows based on day of the year, um, what the percentage hatch would be anywhere in the country. And so when we have folks who, you know, saw the live um, lantern fly uh, that they, they killed and hopefully got, they got everything in Washington, when they call us up and they say, hey, Julie, I don't have any money. I don't have field crews. I don't have resources to devote to um, surveying for these things. Well, they can look at this hatch map and know when it's going to hatch so that they can time their surveys a little bit better. And then the part that, um, this is where my work in particular, um, I, I see that um, in order to truly solve an applied problem, you really under, need to understand the basic biology. And so I'm very fascinated with that, um, with that late season feeding. And so here you can see these have red valvuli. So these are both females. And these are two females where we rip their legs off because that's what we do in my lab. And you can see that one is bright, you know, big and yellow and the other one isn't. These were only collected a month apart. And so they're feeding voraciously and just, you know, one set of data that I collected a couple of years ago, just taking live masses. You can see that in five weeks, females will pack on a, an additional 50% of their mass. Um, males will really fatten up too. And so what's interesting here, and back to my symbiont work, and this was what totally got me intrigued with lanternfly, is that, as I mentioned, they house bacteria in organs um, that, and they have three different species of bacteria uh, and each is housed in its own organ. And you can actually see them, the two in these little string-like structures around to the right, those we've sequenced their genome, they synthesize amino acids missing in the, in the phloem diet. The third one in what we technically call the sausage, uh, it has a bigger genome and we're, we're trying to characterize that a little bit, but it, it's this bright um, orange structure. But what's interesting is that if you look at, this is a, a lateral view of a female, you can see she's kind of skinny. She doesn't really have any yellow um, extended. She's not very developed. But if you look at a larger female, what you see is that the position and morphology of these endosymbiont organs change. Um, this thing, the sausage gets pale, it breaks apart. Um, basically these organs are kind of intercalated with the digestive tract, which isn't too surprising because of their, you know, their provisioning amino acids and nutrients. But in order to get transmitted to the eggs, these are bacteria, you know, one is Sulcii that's ancestral to Akenaranka, so that's a 270 million year old infection. The second one is ancestral to, to Fulgoroidea, to plant hoppers, so that's a 130 year old infection. And the sausage I found to be ancestral to Fulgorid, so about 50 million years old. So for them to get transmitted, they can't live outside the insect anymore. For them to get transmitted to the next generation, they have to enter the eggs. And so it's interesting to see how these um, bacteria move and become, um, they actually, you see them laying on, on the eggs and, and that's how the transmission happens. So I'm very interested in characterizing what those stages are of transmission and looking to understand, you know, the, the molecular control for that, but also is that 
potentially a sensitive time period where they'd be more amenable to just sheer disruption by chemical or other means. And so I, I did that, but also what's interesting is that we really don't understand spotted landerfly um, reproductive development. And so this is where I, as I was talking about this with colleagues, they're like, Julie, we kind of need to know this stuff. We need to know when they're mated. And so a lot of what I'm doing is I have landerfly that have been collected by myself and colleagues um, weekly across, you know, the last three years in depth, I have literally 10,000, tens of thousands of landerfly that I've been dissecting. And so, um, not into the 10,000s yet, but I have them in my house, I've done many. And so I'll image this expanded yellow area. And I'm interested in looking at um, how their growth might vary depending on what we're collecting them on. Because just to mention to date, nobody's been able, been able to really um, rear a healthy population of spotted lanternfly in the lab. Tracy Lesky's gotten them to adults. Kelly Hoover's gotten them to them, but they're not as fit. They're not as fit as they are in the wild. And I, I do dissections for them and, and see that they're just not um, necessarily as, as viable. And so um, this is what a spermatophore looks like that I found in dissections. And so I'm looking to see the timing of when they've made it and how that relates or might relate to what they're feeding on. But also what I'm doing is characterizing the stages of female reproductive development. When does egg laying start and end? Um, they seem to be able to lay more than one egg mass. That's going to have big implications as they move south, I think. And so when have they made it and are they at risk? They'll fly into trains as adults. When are they at risk for, for being gravid and, and mated and transported to new sites? And then interestingly, because it takes so long for them to uh, develop into reproductive maturity, you know, it might not be the overwintering egg that imposes the thermal limits on this thing. It might be where there's enough, um, where there's a long enough growing season essentially for them to feed as much as they need to. And so my colleague, uh, Dennis Calvin, who recently retired, he was the head of extension for Penn State. Um, he and John Ross like took samples over like every two weeks on literally the same trees across two years and recorded you know, adult emergence when they saw the first yellow-sided female and, and did degree day modeling. And basically what for that, it takes um, 1,150 degree days to go from hatch to adult. And it takes about two thirds of that, and this is for 50% of the population, it takes about two thirds of that time again to get to reproductive maturity. And so to me, I think that could be an Achilles heel. And so um, I, this was based on observations. We miss a lot with these stupid bugs. And so I'm doing the dissections to verify exactly how this reproductive development is occurring, because this also doesn't take into account multiple egg masses, but to really figure out what are those degree day limits. But just looking at a map here, um, the 2290 degree days is what you need for about 50% of egg masses to be laid. And those are, you know, basically that's a little bit darker blue on the map, but you can see there might be some areas, not many, unfortunately, but some areas where there's just not enough growing degree days for them to develop. But again, we'll, we'll fine tune this. And then just, you know, a lot of other things going on just to give you a, a, a some of what of an idea I mentioned the their mouth parts, and so some of you might be familiar with um, EPG technology. This was developed by Elaine. Well, it's been developed for aphids for years, but Elaine Backus really developed it for larger insects like glassy wing sharpshooter. We're actually working with Elaine. My postdoc was Elaine's technician for ten years, and so basically here, what you do is if you uh, put an electrode, you know, in the plant, and and you read, you run a waveform through the run a, a current through the plant. And you can see you tether your poor little lantern fly on a gold wire and you run the electric current through your little lantern fly. And when the mouth parts enter into the plant tissue, they give a waveform. And so as been shown with glass wing sharpshooter and aphids and whatnot, that waveform varies depending on whether they're salivating, if they're penetrating phloem, if they're penetrating xylem, if they're eliciting a salivary sheath that kind of cloaks them from plant defenses. And so um, what my postdoc is doing now, in order to be able to interpret these waveforms, you need to decode them. So you need to kill them and do the histology and see exactly where the mouth parts um, 
are in the plant when you killed the insect and got that waveform. So there's a lot of decoding to do, but uh, this is work under going on in my lab right now. So I'm pretty excited about that. And the idea is not just to better understand how it's damaging grapes in particular, but basically if you give it a range of plants that it feeds on more easily or prefers more, you know, versus other things it can't feed on as well or, or prefers less, um, then you can start to, and if you think about that in terms of grape varieties, um, basically then you can start to identify plant traits that might hinder feeding. And so that could help inform selection of, of varieties or, or creation of plant of grape varieties that might be more resistant to lanternfly. Also, I'm really interested um, I don't know, I've been in applied land long enough to be kind of excited by some of these insecticides. I'm interested to see how different feeding inhibitors and whatnot might mess with their, their feeding behavior and how maybe some soft chemicals, softer chemicals um, might, might uh, disrupt uh, their ability to, to suck on, on plant phloem and we might be able to optimize the timing in conjunction with the endosymbiont movement to kind of hit them with a little bit softer compounds. Um, just to mention, you know, we have, I have 37 different um, other co-PIs with me on this grant. So there's all sorts of things. We try to keep it updated at stopslf.org. But um, I know uh, the parasitoids and natural enemies is, is a very um, interesting dimension of this. And Kim Holmer at USDA ARS, Julie Gould at APHIS, and, and working in collaboration with folks at, at Delaware and, and Rhode Island and whatnot, are looking at um, classical bio, biological control. And so there's um, this Anastatus wasp that Kim Holmer that, and Julie Gold that they brought over, they're working on these different subspecies. Um, and it seems to be pretty good at hitting lanternfly eggs, but it, it, it tends to be more of a generalist. So there's some issues there, but this is a dryanid um, parasitoid that will hit uh, lanternfly nymphs that they're studying. And then there's different fungal pathogens. Um, Anne Hayek at Cornell is looking at those. This is also contributed to using um, Bavaria, which is a, a commercially available product. Uh, it's intimate pathogenic to try to control lanternfly. That's not going so great, have to be honest. But again, that kind of gives you somewhat of the overview of, of what we're up to. And I think with that, I'll, I'll stop here and take any questions. Thanks very much, Joy. Right. Joy, you really, you. you really packed Fair a lot enough. in there. Thanks. Um, so if um, people want to ask questions, if you, if you move your cursor down towards the bottom of the Zoom screen, the, uh, there's a a toolbar appear, appears and one of the things you can click on is reactions. And if you click on that, then there's a place where you can click on another one that says raise hand. And then that would identify you if you have a, a question to ask. But um, I just first like to tell Julie, um, so we had a total of uh, 41 participants today and I could see there's multiple people at some of the, uh, some of the screens. So we had a very good turnout, so. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. And um, I had a, 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 a one, one question for you. Um, um, you mentioned that how important the symbionts are. Is there any way like to attack the the symbionts? Like you know somehow put antibiotics in the plant, or is there any possibility of something like that? I've been trying that, and so um, my first round of that was problematic because the antibiotics that I used had a sulfur compound in it that made them phytotoxic, so that wasn't good, and I, I wasn't familiar with that. I got my hands on, on some that didn't have the sulfur compound and did a study where we um, injected, where I injected those into a uh, small potted tree of heaven that had maybe, you know, uh, weren't very large, like maybe two inch caliper and just used a drill. I have a, uh, we have a, an extension person who used to be a, an applicator. And so he helped inform me with this and he's licensed and I'm not, but essentially I drilled into the plants and then um, used a, a syringe and dripped um, antibiotic into it. And I combined that with azitiractin, which is um, like a feeding inhibitor. And then another compound that's like more um, hits the nervous system. And, and essentially what, what that uh, did in that first round, um, it, it basically 
caused the, the trees to drop all their leaves. It was a little bit too much for these small trees. And then the lanternflies were able to kind of feed long enough and they stimulated new growth in these trees. So I was able to, with the antibiotic, keep them alive longer on plants than anybody has able to been to, have been, had been able to to this point. And so I'm still tweaking that. Um, part of that, and so we're, we're doing that, we're trying to replicate that better in the lab, but yes, the whole idea of an antibiotic by itself, like that in and of itself can't necessarily be a good solution, although I know they're, they're doing similar things with, with Asian citrus psyllid, but I think that if you could get some synergy and do it at a low enough level and then hit it with an insecticide that either alone wouldn't be sufficient, but in combination could be, that's definitely one of the things we're working on. So I'm trying to like get it at both ends. Okay, um, I see Susan Halbert has a question. Hi, Susan, I haven't seen you in a long time. This is gonna be a good awesome. question. I stayed late at work to listen. We've had several credible sightings in Florida, but we haven't oh. seen any bugs. Okay. And one of the things that I wondered was if they would um, maintain their life cycle on the many, many wild grapevines we have growing all over the forest here. Oh yeah. I mean, those, so, so they love wild grapevines. They, and they kill them. Um, I had a student who was um, using amplicon sequencing to characterize the fungal communities on sooty mold. And so we were, um, we were swabbing uh, wild grapevines, cultivated grapevines and tree of heaven, you know, plants. And, and basically they would, they fed so heavily on the, on the wild grapevines that we didn't have enough leaves to sample. So we've seen them just nail wild grapevines. Um, the thing that I don't know about, and we're kind of looking into with a master's student I have is uh, they have such a high metabolic rate and, but they also seem to be very sensitive. Um, Mike Saunders used to say that harsh language kills them. I mean, easily, you know, like exposing them to heat and high temperatures um, is a problem. Well, you know, they respire so much, even putting them in a, in a glass jar with netting over them and trying to transport them out to put them onto plants for our, our studies, they, that kills them right there. And so what we're doing is we're, my student is um, taking ambient temperatures of lanternfly throughout the day in, in fields, um, in vineyards, but also we're going to look at thermal limits um, because I'm, I'm wondering that it just, it just might be too hot for them to really survive there as adults. And so do you think that even if we don't have tree of heaven, that the grapevines alone would support the population as long as the temperatures are, aren't overwhelming? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you have China berry there. We do. Oh, yep. Yep. Nope. It's, uh, it, it feeds on those in its native range and, and feeds on those. Um, Miriam Cooper banded aphis was able to like have some pretty good success keeping them alive on that. And, and again, because they just move around so much, um, they don't, and, and they exist in places in China where there is no tree of heaven um, from what we've been told. And so I, yes, I think that they can really persist. That's not gonna be the limiting factor. How far south in China do they go? I'd have to look at that again. There, that's a really good question. Taiwan? I'm not sure. No, no. Thanks. Not that I, no, my understanding, nope. Matt or Lourdes, do you guys have a question? Hi, hi Julie, super, super cool talk. Um, Thanks. I'm, I know with my, my work with the Lesky on the B, it was fascinating that SB range in its native range seemed to be than what we saw here. And kind of the working hypothesis was there was some sort of bottleneck um, that allowed the host range in terms of what plants they could feed on to just basically almost be limitless, it seems here. Um, is it known? Is I think you're, you're, I don't know if it's my internet or if it's your internet, you're kind of, are other folks having a problem? It seems like he's there. falling out. Yeah. I, 
Uh, I think we lost, we lost, now you're moving, we lost you on internet for a second. Could you repeat, Matt? I, I'm sorry. That's good. I got to practice my question before okay. I actually got to ask it. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> it, was, it was about the host range for lanternfly here versus in its native range. Do we see a difference? Is it expanded here relative to its native range? I don't think the, the, the native range is well known in China. And, and so I, yeah, that's, that's, I kind of, that's kind of the problem with it. But I suspect it's not very different because, I mean, if you're thinking about evolutionarily, an insect that lays its eggs on anything, you know, in Borneo, they were on a sign, you know. And so I think that you don't lay your eggs on anything if you're not going to feed broadly on a lot of stuff. Well, I have a question. Hey, Stuart. Hi. Um, did I know early on they were they were putting systemic insecticides in the trees, mm -hmm. in the trees they leave standing? Is mm -hmm. that still being used or is it just out the window? No, they're still using it. So basically, yeah, they would, the original, if, mm -hmm. if folks aren't familiar, the original um, uh, governmental attack uh, strategy was to remove like 90% of tree of heaven and leave the remaining 10% and inject it with a systemic, like typically with dinotefuran or even bark band it or, you know, soil drench it with, with dinotefuran or imidacloprid and leave that and that would kill it. Uh, they got rid of the tree removal part because that's just, that was too problematic in terms of just getting permission to get on people's properties and that kind of thing. Um, they are doing um, bark sprays. And so they're keeping up with that. And then rather than killing tree of heaven, they're treating it with herbicides. But I think it's questionable to the extent that that necessarily has really killed the tree of heaven. There's places where that hasn't seemed really efficacious. Um, and then the other thing that, that came to light with that is, and this was like a, a, a really long dialogue, Penn State, you know, we'd been having with them. It's like, okay, you're, you're toast if you take a, a tree species specific way to do this, because, you know, tree of heaven isn't the only thing they feed on. And if they're moving on to red and silver maple late in the fall, you know, that doesn't help. And so I appreciate that the constraints there are um, those systemic compounds can remain in the tree, depending on when you treat them, depending like imidacloprid and dinotefuran are like imidacloprid is um, not water soluble, dinotefuran is, so their persistence rates are really different. And so if you treat something late, it can stick around, the, the systematic can stick around and be present in the nectar and pollen and nail pollinators the next year. And that's a lot of the work that, that we're doing. And we have a farm bill proposal in to try to look at that systematically a little bit more about how these trees retain that tissue. And so I can see where they're not gonna want to, you know, put a systemic onto red maple, but what are you gonna do if you're only treating tree of heaven? And so what they're also doing now is using bifenthrin, uh, which is, you know, which will knock them down. And they've been treating more, um, like high like sites at high risk for transport. So around you know, the there's there's a moving front it, that's moved into Harrisburg this year. So they treated the Harrisburg International Airport with bifenthrin just to knock down because then if you do an aerial wide application, not with a systemic but with a contact, then you can try to hit those pop ups or protect your port. They treated around the port of Philadelphia and whatnot too. But and, and they finally got permission to treat on rail lines. And so that tends to be very effective. But again, if, if the population's already moved out, you know, anywhere, like we have uh, Kelly Hoover's postdoc, Joe Keller, who's doing some really cool work looking at tracking pop-up populations like around Pittsburgh, Altoona, Stroudsburg, that kind of thing, and monitoring them with different trapping methods. And, and so far, any treatment of pop-ups, certainly within Pennsylvania and really anywhere, haven't kept up and haven't been able to locally eradicate a population. Your, your colleague from Pennsylvania, John Gelhaus, has his hand raised. Hello, John. Hi, um, great talk. Thank you, Julie. Um, so, you know, we, we got hit with them in Philadelphia. It was really interesting. This was when I was working at the museum regularly before pandemic. 
but that fall, they just uh, converged downtown. They were crawling up tall buildings, but it wasn't all over downtown. It was just certain areas. So they seemed to be hitting maybe wind currents or something, mm -hmm. but adults were everywhere in the, in the fall in these certain block areas. And there were other parts in the city too. So that was really interesting. But I'm in, I live in South Jersey. And so they hit okay. about three years ago in my neighborhood. And so I've kind of watched as they, from the first adults that I saw coming in the fall and then the nymphs and all of that. Um, and just two things that really strike me is that movement to tree of heaven in the fall. I mean, just, you know, that's where you see those adults congregating. And I wonder what they might be picking up from tree of heaven, which seems to be it's an odd tree, has an odd smell, and I just have to think, and not a lot feeds on it, obviously, um, but except maybe the Atlantis web spinner moth or whatever, but I wonder what they're picking up there. And then the other thing that I've kind of noticed is we haven't, I mean, we haven't hit these huge, huge numbers. So it, in fact, this year seems to be pretty muted at least what I'm observing in my neighborhood. So I'm wondering if some of these populations hit a certain point and then just start to dip down. Have you been seeing that in areas that were really high density, but they haven't remained at high density? Yes, I just have to say your observations, you're, you're so good, we, we, we should have you join the team because you're, we'd, you're spot we'd on. We'd love to, yes. <laughs> Um, so, so what's interesting there, so in terms of that late season, like Ilanthus, yes, uh, this is something um, that, you know, it's not known whether or not they're able to sequester the Ilanthone or the other, you know, toxic compounds that it produces. And it's thought that maybe that might confer, uh, make them unpalatable for to predators. And so Kelly Hoover student, um, uh, Ann Johnson is looking at that with Dorothea Toll from Virginia Tech. And they're looking at, you know, feeding, like raising lanternfly, feeding it on, allowing it to feed on tree of heaven versus not and presenting it to birds and other predators, that kind of thing. Um, and so they might be getting something there, certainly. And, and it's also interesting kind of anecdotally there that the fourth instars in particular really like black walnut and that has mm -hmm. juglans. So a similar kind of thing, um, but also like, uh, you've seen them moving onto tree of heaven in the fall. And what they move on to kind of is a function of probably the, the, the local population density, but also what they had been feeding on. So in here where we've had established populations where like in the, in, in the Berks area, where they would feed on, on tree of heaven and then move off onto red or silver maple. And so it's more, I think they're moving on to something that they haven't locally depleted seems to be because it's it's different things again showing that relative preference that that food preference is relative to what's around and so um that goes into the next part of your question where people are saying oh did the core collapse because we're definitely seeing that same thing and so um but with that uh there's certainly some areas where we you know, there's not a lantern fly to be found. And, and unfortunately those are our study sites. And oh. so we have that, that vineyard. And, and it's funny, Ann Nielsen presented the exact same thing about her vineyards in New Jersey at our ESA symposium. And so one particular site, the one I showed you that overlooks the, the distribution centers outside of Allentown, um, Heather Leach, who no longer wor works with us, but she's our lanternfly extension person and doing like tremendous great research. Uh, she built a 30 foot wall and put up exclusion netting and interspersed it with insecticide treated netting to try to keep lanternfly, you know, out of that vineyard. And she killed um, 15,000 lanternfly, you know, in the late season last year. And if you build it, they won't come. There's none there this year. <laughs> there's hardly any and so um and they're moving in later last year they moved in september mid-september this year when they did move in they moved in mid-october and so my sense is that it's it's just that local resource depletion 
that they they kind of tapped out those trees and they've moved out. People report the same thing going on with brown murmured stink bug that like the populations just collapsed. But my understanding with that is, is more that you have a, a, a native stink bug complex of about seven different species that has their own natural enemies and parasitoids here. And so it's that those parasitoids and, you know, just kind of moved on to, it took them a while to find uh, BMSB, but just kind of moved on to it because it was similar. There's nothing really similar to this, to this yeah. for here. So I, even Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is asking us like, oh, did, did we, are we solving it? You know, it's like, man, I want to tell you, you did, but with as much as it's spreading throughout the country and stuff, I, I, I think it's more, if anything, the mechanism would be that local depletion. And I, I don't trust that. I mean, the trees, again, they only tr have, have been shown to kill tree of heaven or grapes. They're more a stress around to other things and those trees can come back and I bet they'll come back. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering. And I will follow up with what you said earlier about the penguins. And I tell my, you know, I have students in my class and they're sick of spotted lanternfly because they've been all over the Philadelphia and, you know, whatever. But I say to them, you know, as an entomologist, I still marvel. This is a fulgur, you know, for, right? we never get to see these things around here. So it, it is it is a cool really interesting insect even though all the problems it's causing so thanks again for your talk thank you i appreciate you saying that because like my my colleagues at penn state while they're very supportive and they'll still collect the insects for me uh they think i have a problem but they just say i like you i like the way your face lights up so much when i give you falcon tubes of lanternfly <laughs>especially in, in looking at the, you know, insecticide work, it's very triage driven, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of, of what folks have been doing in, in thinking about, I think, and, and, and really until recently not thinking about, you know, growth inhibitors and that kind of thing is because um, the growers in particular, like the grape growers, uh, whatever they apply for Japanese beetle, whatever they're normally applying for the early instars, it, it, it knocks them out. So our, our recommendations don't even include any, any treatment of vineyards for, for um, uh, nymphs. But yeah. that's kind of, yes, that's an area where we want to go. So good idea. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I was in the right ballpark there. Um, one other question, if you would, really quick, a follow-up yeah. uh, from me. So, John, uh, you mentioned about the, um, you know, the, the native pa uh, parasites of BMSB kind of, you know, normalizing to, to attacking or, you know, parasitizing them. Um, and I know anecdotally in my yard, the spiders and the mantids do really well with uh, spotted lanternfly. They, they love them, especially the Chinese mantids. They uh, uh -huh. go nuts with them. So I didn't know if you saw anything like that happening, maybe a, a native predator or bird, birds or other insects that might be 
turning towards them now? Not necessarily in high numbers. So not enough to really necessarily knock things down. That's something that Kelly Hoover's grad student Ann Johnson's looking at. And actually she has a citizen science project. Um, I think there's a link on the stopslf.org site where she's having citizen scientists, like, you know, people report in if they see different birds feeding on them. And, cool. and I kind of think she might be, I don't know if she's collecting data on other, on like insect predators or whatnot, but wheel bugs are a big one. Um, we're suspicious about uh, nymphal lace wings. And then slugs Ooh. is something. Yeah. So um, I hope so. But yeah, I, I'm not really sure. Um, she's, she's looking at that and also looking at um, that in combination with whether or not they fed on Alanthus and to see if there's like a certain, um, like certain types of predation that, uh, they're a little bit more prone to. So something like a wheel bug, if you're like sucking their guts out, you don't care if they're toxic, you know? Yeah, <laughs> for, sure. for sure. No, thank you very much. And great talking thank again. You. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Julie, John mentioned, you know, the, the tree of heaven has a strong smell. Is, is anybody looking like for an attractant, you know, they could be put in a trap or something? Yes, definitely. That's something that that Tracy Lesky at USDA ARS is is working on, and also um, looking. At the her postdoc Laura Nixon has been working this up, but also looking at and uh, they've been collecting plant volatiles for trees that are being attacked because we see that lanternfly, you know, tend to feed in high numbers on certain trees, and so you'll see. Uh, if it's, if it's tree, I mean, so they're focusing on tree of heaven, but, um, but, but basically to see if, if that increases, you know, if the feeding increases a signal, but what's also interesting with that is, uh, we talk about what are called, what we've called hot trees. And when we reported this to APHIS, they thought I was just out of my mind, but once you know what you're talking about, it's, it's true. There's certain, um, like individual trees that lantern flies will feed in high numbers on and not the same species of tree right next to it. And so we observe this anecdotally, but we're able to um, document it. And it's one of the publications in the special issue of environmental entomology on lanternfly. And it's, it's uh, led by Charlie Mason as the first author. And in that study, uh, we had, um, ornamental trees. They were red maple that were planted, you know, in suburban areas, like going up to a nursing home in one case. And we had, you know, 20 red maples, same age, same size on each side of the street. And they were treated with different insecticides. And um, so basically, uh, when they're treated with dinotefuran, everybody that comes into that tree uh, dies. And so we were recording number of individuals that were dead each week. And so uh, the same trees that really uh, attracted and where we collected, you know, thousands of dead lantern fly, you know, in one year were also consistently those same tre trees that had high numbers in the other, other years. And so it's, they had higher nitrogen compounds, higher nitrogen um, levels in the foliage. That's not enough to really drive it. You know, we've tried fertilizers and that kind of stuff, but we're trying to see what is it that they're queuing into in the trees um, that makes some really attractive. Because if we, if we can predict where they're going to be, you know, we don't want landscape companies to do kind of what they're doing, which are preventative treatments. Like, oh, treat your trees twice a year with metacloprid, you know, whether they're fed on or not, right? If we know where they're going to go, then we can kill them in high numbers and kind of be done with it. Because uh, for example, our, the landscaper who we have working with us now in extension, um, one silver maple that he injected, um, he collected over 14,000 dead in seven days. And so, in terms of back to Alan's question, or no, in John's question, what, what are they getting from these things? What are they getting from Tree of Heaven? I also think that uh, Tree of Heaven doesn't really um, heal itself, right? It has high turgor pressure. And, you know, I'm learning more. I think there's a lot about the vascular system of these trees. And I hope the EPG work will like tune us into that. They, you know, they, they strongly prefer silver maple, red maple, not sugar maple, you know, certain things. So I think if we decode across species, what they're more attracted to, that's going to help us.
Great, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, great talk. I think my connection is a bit unstable, I think. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, thank you again, um, Julie, for, for such a great talk. And, and you made such an amazing transition from evolutionary biology to, <laughs> to doing all these sorts of things and managing a gigantic project. That's amazing. It's, it's more methods and more toys you get to play with in the lab. So that's all good. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the great, great questions. I really enjoyed talking with y'all. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Al, um, and the great questions. Um, okay, so uh, this wraps up our, our meeting today. Um, I have one final announcement regarding uh, the next meeting, which is December 2nd. Um, and the speaker is um, Dr. Jessica Ware from American Museum of Natural History, New York. And it's also the annual meeting, and that's when new officers will be elected, uh, and there'll be a report from President um, Jamie Zanazer uh, over the, the year's activities. Uh, so tune in to that. And uh, some, yes, yeah, some great comments and, and people thanking and so on. And uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Okay, second. And then. Great, thank you. And I don't have a gavel. I'm supposed to have like a little gavel. There we go. <laughs> Meetings adjourned. I used to have, I guess I had that for the beginning. So, okay, great. Great seeing everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thanks again, bye -bye. Julie. Safe travels the rest of your trip. Yes, thank you. safe travels. <laughs> I appreciate it. And thanks to whoever sent me the link to uh, a paper. That was great. Well, you know. All right, take care, bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.